today, Dave DeWalt. I'll be moderating the cycle panel. You guys ready to get scared a little bit? Yeah. You ready to ask us some questions by the end? Some brave volunteers? Okay. Good. By the way, I have just an amazing group of friends uh, on the panel here, some of which I've worked together for, it feels like 100 years in some cases, in the world of cyber, sometimes it feels like 100 years, and um, I'll let them introduce themselves for a minute, but I don't know how many of you are familiar with the world of cyber and what an incredible domain the world of cyber has become. Uh, I was formerly the CEO of McAfee uh, way back when, and uh, the market was pretty small. We sold antivirus products. Maybe some of you used those products. And we used to be worried about things like viruses and all kinds of trojans and worms that really didn't have a whole lot of um, real damage to them. I remember one of them that was called the I Love You virus, which was popping up on Valentine's Day and spread to 100,000 computers. And it was all over the news around you know, some virus that could uh, you know, permeate to a couple hundred thousand computers. Today, we live in an incredibly different world. When I, first, when I left McAfee, we had 68 million viruses that we were tracking. And this is back in 2011. So just 10 years later, you know, here we are with 68 million or so viruses, parasitics, polymorphics, and an incredible world that we lived in. I was then CEO of FireEye and Mandiant, which was another incredible era of watching espionage and warfare and terrorism and, and uh, had a chance to take that company public. So I spent two decades kind of on the front lines of cyber in an incredible way, witnessing a rising set of dangers from activism to crime to ultimately espionage and terrorism and now warfare in the battlefield of Russia and Ukraine. So, what a world that we have. I call it a perfect storm, by the way. You know, almost this perpetual set of technologies and inertias that are occurring. You know, every day we have wonderful new advancements in technologies. We have wonderful advancements in our world that we can live in, yet the danger and dark side of all of that is it creates vulnerabilities. And those vulnerabilities get exploited. There's now hundreds uh, of groups real permanent actors that really are at the center of the crime and espionage and activities and warfare that are happening around the world. And we live in an asymmetric theater now. The cyber industry has become almost 200 billion a year in revenues. Um, we've now watched almost 30 billion of investments going into the cyber market, 29.6 just in 2021. And to think about almost 30 billion of investments in a single year going into that, and the size of the market now being nearly 200 billion a year, this market has grown. And this market is growing three, four, five times faster than IT as a whole, because the market is so fraught with risk, so fraught with danger, that we really are seeing this asymmetric theater. Last year, we saw almost six trillion in losses in cyber. So now imagine a $200 billion market with six trillion in losses. And you can see what asymmetry is occurring in the world of cyber. And now cyber is beginning to fuse into nearly every walk of our life. So our physical threats, our cyber threats, our supply chain, our race to space, cyber has become ubiquitous across just about every threat domain that's in the world, really creating a, a really fascinating, somewhat ominous, but pretty exciting opportunity to really create a peaceful world if we could all work together as part of that. So I have some just incredible people. I've been a CEO for many years. Uh, I run a platform called Night Dragon, which does investments and advisory in the world of cyber at this point. I found it's a lot easier telling CEOs what to do than do it myself, so what a great job I have now, and I uh, have a lot of fun with it. We have uh, many, many companies in our portfolio that we've worked with, but I have some just incredible people on the stage with me today and uh, some friends. So maybe start with you, Dave, just for a second, introduce yourself and Katie and uh, Eric as well. Yeah, and I mean, I, before I introduce myself, I just want the audience to know what a great honor it is to have Dave DeWald as the moderator, because in this uh, space in cyber, this is like the Bono of, uh, of I can sing too, watch out, I can sing Bono. You know, when we, we, we all go out to, the, to a very large cybersecurity conference in San Francisco every year, but the RSA conference, and it's it's fun to watch Dave try, try to walk around because he just gets he just gets 
mobbed uh, by everyone. So we are lucky to have Dave uh, moderating here. So my name is Dave Berg. I am the, uh, the America's Cyber Leader at EY, Ernst & Young. EY is a, a very large uh, professional services firm. It's about 330,000 employees uh, worldwide. Uh, we, we audit, uh, we, we perform audits, we do consulting, we do tax, and we do and and so and we have a very large cyber team. So just to give you a little sense of uh, the size and scale, it's about a three billion dollar a year cyber business. The thing that I'm responsible for in the Americas, which is North America, uh, Central America, South America, and Israel, is about 1.8 billion of that. Most of that is in the United States. The United States is by far the largest market in the world, the most sophisticated in the world. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have this, you know, this very large economy where many multinationals are, are headquartered and they, many of them operate all around the world. Um, just from a background perspective, um, I, it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, story or journey. The very first cyber thing that I worked on was this fascinating um, ransomware attack in 2001 when a Russian hacker wanted a ransom of $200. That was, that was the original ransom demand in 2001. In 2007, I worked on a, a very uh, famous cyber intrusion at a place called RBS WorldPay, and it's famous because $10 million were taken out of an ATM network in 24 hours by human ghouls that were given prepaid cards that were distributed all around the world, and it was beautifully orchestrated and really scared the heck out of uh, bank regulators all around the world. Um, and then I, and then what happened was just a, some of what David was talking about, just a, a wave of cyber activity. So then it became uh, nation state, these advanced persistent threats basically hitting every single industry, one after another after another. A lot of activity coming out of Eastern Europe with these really more theft of data, monetization schemes. And then, uh, and so I worked on, uh, I, I worked on the, the, the Sony matter, I worked on Equifax, there was a destructive malware attack at a, at a company called Saudi Aramco uh, in Saudi Arabia. And so we started seeing more of these destructive uh, malware attacks in 2017 and not patches, I think really, really changed the game in the industry where you had companies that were Operationally wiped out. Merck, Maersk, Mondelez, FedEx, other 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 big companies, and it all emanated from uh, attacks on the Ukraine, which is obviously a pretty hot topic today. Uh, so um, you know, I, I've seen a lot. A lot of the things that I saw were responding to really bad events, using products that that, that Dave's company made, or worked with, with with Dave and his colleagues. And then as a consultant, what we would do is we would help to, to try to fix the problems. Today, I spend a lot of time uh, going in and briefing Fortune 500, Fortune 100, Fortune 50 boards, talking about cyber. Oftentimes, what we do is we'll do some assessment. We'll, we'll evaluate their security program and tell them you know, how they compare to other, other companies of similar size and scale in the industry board in some cases. Sometimes when we look at insurance companies, for example, we benchmark them against technology companies uh, just to give them a, a kind of a relative uh, <coughs> Perspective. Um, so, you uh, see a lot in the boardroom and, and certainly in uh, corporations across really all sectors. And uh, good to be here today, today. Thank you. Dave, it's so great to have you, by the way. And the uh, feeling is mutual. I know you and I have been on the battlefield front lines for, I don't know, countless. When I was running Mandiant as well, we do thousands of incident responses. We work very closely with Dave at PwC and now at EY. I mean, I think he's forgotten more than most of us know in the world of cyber. So thank you, seriously, for joining us. What an incredible honor. Multi-billion dollar business you run. A lot of responsibility. Great to see you. And you reverse aging. Way to go. Thank you, Dave. Really <laughs> um, our next guest uh, is on the other side of the line. And I have an incredible amount of respect for Katie. Katie runs and is the chief security officer for Liberty Mutual. And for somebody on the other side who's kind of playing goalie every day, and your goal is not to let one puck in the net, and there's hundreds of thousands of attacks a day, 
not sure how you sleep at night, but introduce yourself, Katie. Thank you for joining us. What an incredible honor to have you here as well. And uh, introduce yourself if you would. Awesome. Tell us how you sleep at night. <laughs> I don't have any secrets to share there, but I thought you were gonna say I was on the other side of the line because I'm not a Dave. But anyway, <laughs> thank you for that introduction. I am Katie Jenkins. I have been the Chief Information Security Officer for Liberty Mutual for the past five years. Um, I have a dawning realization this week that I've been a cybersecurity practitioner, called an information security, data protection practitioner, but for 25 years. So your introduction um, harkened back to the days where the I love you virus was, you know, our biggest concern. And uh, certainly the field has, has evolved dramatically over that time. Um, I spent my early part of my career in uh, professional services, helping companies establish programs, doing social engineering and physical pen tests, giving uh, a, a, a set of um, goals to get beyond uh, you know, physical uh, control structures and get into data centers and, and find proof of, of that infiltration, things that were kind of you know fun but weird at the time, to everything from being uh, owning a, a cyber program at Liberty for the past 13 years. Um, and it really has been remarkable, um, the type of change in, in seeing cybersecurity as being sort of a back office function but being really thrust into the uh, you know critical business priorities because it's a board uh, priority, because it's something that um, our executives care deeply about, maybe not because they care about the subject matter itself, but they recognize that safeguarding business operations is where it's at, and that's where the intersection of our work um, really, really comes to play. So I'm thrilled to be here, and uh, yeah, I'm passing it on to Eric. Before you do, I just, uh, again, I want to say thank you, Katie. I mean, it's not easy for chief security officers to, to manage the operations, and Liberty Mutual is an amazing one in that they not only are, she's also defending networks, but Liberty Mutual also has a lot of business in the area of cyber insurance. She has to protect a lot of citizens' data as it relates to it, but businesses as well, what an incredible role you have. So thank you, and one of the most prominent women in all of cyber, so thank you for that too. Incredible to be here. And you're a lot taller than I thought you were on Everyone show. says that on Zoom. I'm not a one-by-one one. I wear heels today, but you know, I'm, yeah. Tom Blast Waters, they say. I love it. Eric, uh, I want to say thank you to you joining as well. We have a long relationship. For those who don't know Momentum Cyber, you need to you need to know this company. Um, if you ever want some bedtime reading, they put out what's called the Cyber Almanac, and I think the last one I probably have the wrong number of pages, but it was somewhere around 764 pages of everything about the cyber industry, all inventory. They also put out this cyber landscape report, which is a collage of all the companies in every category of cyber, now measured in thousands and thousands of companies. I'm not sure how you get every one of the logos onto the font size needed to now put that on, but some of the most powerful content uh, industry analysis of what's happening in the world of cyber. Eric's the founder of Momentum Cyber and uh, knows a lot about the industry as well. So sorry for doing a little intro for you, but it's fun to work with you. Introduce yourself a little bit more if you would. Yeah, thanks Dave. I'll, I'll stick with the stories then since you got the bio out there. <laughs> uh, I used to reference Dave as the EF hub of cyber. Oh, hold when, Dave, when Dave would speak, everyone would just listen, all right? So, uh, I'm going to start using bottom of that's much cooler, especially for this festival. <laughs> Dave, Dave and I met in a pretty peculiar way. You hit me up on LinkedIn, and I just like really literally had this like career moment, right? Here we are creating this boutique investment bank. We knew the world needed a very focused cybersecurity advisory practice. And if you look at what the big four firms have done in specialization, you look at what the venture capitalists have done in specialization. If you want a financial advisor in the courtroom, they need to understand the subject matter. You really need to have a point of view. And cybersecurity is so vastly complicated. I my my analogy for like my non-cyber friends is imagine walking into the bar of Star Wars and all those aliens are look different, are using different communications, but they're all talking to each other and they're all hanging out, they're a community. 
they know each other. And that's somewhat like cybersecurity. And so you really have to be one of the unique ones, right? And you have to kind of shed this, right? And get into the trenches with these guys. I've spent 20 years in the boardroom, not the battlefield with them, and I'm just grateful to be here with you guys. Um, as Dave said, if anybody uh, is interested in this subject matter, you can go to our website, it's pretty easy, it's MomentumCyber.com. If you want to email me and get on our email list, I'm Eric at ERIC. Uh, we're a very open firm. We do two things. We provide content and we provide advice. One we do for free and we open source that to the community. It's our way to give back and that's the content that they said and I've got a team in the back that I'm so grateful to have here. And we are based in Austin. Here in Austin, I don't know where my boots today. Uh, but we're an Austin-based company, I'm proud of that. Um, and then the other thing that we do, uh, and we charge for that, which is we provide board level advice, strategic advice on you know, the evolution of your company. We call it you know, Series A to exit or incubation to exit. And we're there along the way for all of our clients. And, you know, I start, my, my first exposure to cybersecurity was actually a really scary one, and I wasn't in the field. Uh, my wife and I graduated from Purdue University with technology. I have two engineering degrees uh, and, and just a business degree. And uh, I went in the Air Force to fly. I was going to Vance Air Force Base, which is in sexy Enid, Oklahoma. If anybody knows, like 30,000 students. And the reason why they put Air Force bases out in the middle of nowhere is because sometimes we crash the planes. <laughs> so you want to do that in a farmer's field. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going there, you know, hard charging, you know, I want to be an F 22 pilot. That's like my mission in life. I just grew up watching Top Gun, you know, sort of. VHS tape by word out. My wife, she went to Keesler Air Force Base and studied communications. So this is way before cybersecurity, but you were a communications officer. And so there was a network operations center and that's where all the fires were. And, uh, and so she was in charge of that. And uh, we got the scariest call one night. We were both sleeping, you know, it's the middle of the night. And a sergeant that reported to her, his daughter was abducted over the internet. There was no such thing as internet safety manual or any, any understanding of how that could happen. We had to call the FBI, call the base commander, incident response before Mandy and Kevin Mandy was doing his thing. He was responding to those incidents in the Air Force. And, uh, and my wife, God bless her, she wrote the Air Force's first internet safety manual. And, you know, because we were a team, I would kind of you know, riff on some things with her. And that was our really first exposure to how scary the world online could be. And then I got a business degree, and then I jumped into you know, a Wall Street career, working for a big bank, Citigroup, and then a big private equity firm, Blackstone, and that was my journey. And along the way, I was always the guy in the, in the group that would want to cover cybersecurity. I just thought that was a good mission thing to do. And each time I was told, well, you better do something else, because you're not going to get promoted. There's no path to partner in the 2000s for a guy who covers cybersecurity. And it was around 2011, 2012, you had left McAfee, which at the time, and this record stood for over 10 years, was the largest sale of a cybersecurity company when you sold to Intel and took the reins of FireEye. And both FireEye and Palo Alto went public and really reset the, the valuation understanding uh, with their growth rates. But also, sort of, there was a new generation of cybersecurity companies that were born and entrepreneurs. And that's the moment that I thought the world needs a very focused boutique focused on this. And three years into our journey, you hit me up on LinkedIn. I had you into our little startup space. This was before we were across the Salesforce Tower in Quincy offices now. And you just sat down and gave me your vision for Night Drive, and I gave you my vision for Momentum. And they were like literally the most perfect alignment of visions for investing and advising in cybersecurity companies. So I want to thank you, Dave, for that. And I'll look Careful, I'm going to hit you all up on LinkedIn later. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Eric, set the stage for a minute. I, I want to really get to the meat of this, this uh, event here today. Um, I'm going to start with good news from Eric, which is kind of all the investment side, sort of the numbers for a minute. Momentum does a lot of work on really inventorying the state of cyber. So just spend two minutes, just give us all the stats, because I then want to have the other side of it. We have all these vendors here as well who are involved, and we'll talk a little bit about what's going in on innovation, and then let's talk a little bit about why the breach and risk problem is getting higher too. So walk through a few numbers for us. Why don't I, uh, I'm going to take it this way. I'll define what the landscape is. 
space. So defining kind of scope, when we say the landscape of cybersecurity and investing activity, what is it that we actually mean? And uh, we, we struggled with this uh, for years at the firm because there was no taxonomy for cybersecurity companies, right? They were not easily cataloged. You couldn't go to a website, Forrester, Gartner, they would talk about companies, but nobody actually did a full taxonomy. So we did the first taxonomy, we called it the Cyberscape, and it's evolved over the last five years. And when we first did it, there was 800 companies we had identified as cybersecurity companies. And today, venture back to there's 3,500 companies. So when you think about having to stay relevant and understand this ecosystem, and they're all trying to sell to Katie, they all want her business. Um, there's, it's, it's just a, it's a large, uh, it's a large population of companies to follow. And that's on the private side. Interestingly, on the public side, we've got 30 companies. So for every public company, there's over 100 private companies. And then there's companies like Dave's company, which they do a lot of things for clients, audit, in addition to risk and security. And so you have to understand the security practices within large companies and large technology conglomerates like Microsoft. Google is now a security company. Who would have thought of that? I worked on the Motorola transaction when we were at Blackstone, and I thought that was exciting because we were like, they're going to get into the cell phone business? Just do your job. And run the model. And so you know, to see their Google get into the security business, Amazon get into the security business, you know, this is just fascinating. And so that's really when you think about what the borders are of this team, it's about 3,500 private companies that we identify and follow and track. There's probably 5,000, but and then there's 30 public companies, and then there's the large technology conglomerates. If you add up the value of all of those companies, it's well over a trillion. So if you took the value of the public companies, that's easy, right? I can go buy their stock. Right? I know exactly what their market caps are. The private companies, that's a little bit more artful, but we can do that with our data and get it pretty close. And then you can estimate what the businesses are within the large conglomerates when those are valued at. But it's a big, big industry. So now we have a trillion dollars of valuations in the cyber industry on the defensive side. And we have 3,500 companies. We had $29 billion of investment in a single year and rising. Mm -hmm. We had over 100 billion in mergers and acquisitions last year as it relates to cyber as well in total value. So, yet, we still have $6 trillion a year in losses that are occurring in this cyber space. Katie, spend a minute in day of view as well. So, on the other side, you present to board, your own board a lot. You give a lot of board advice. Start with maybe just even education. Like where are we just in understanding the problem and the risk and the threat? I know you go to your board all the time and not to pick on examples of that, but where do you think we are? And what more do we have to do for education, you know, to be able to help? Because you're on the other side trying to, hey, there's this category called sanity. There's this category called, you know, name it. And it's very complicated in many of the boardrooms don't understand that. What's it like? from an education point of view for a minute in this time. I'm educating on the education because I do feel like that's a significant part of the role that I have. When I'm making year over year investment in my program, I don't expect that to be freely given. So we need to be talking about how is the threat landscape evolving? It gets to the question, why is the risk still rising? And we look as far as you know, the motivation of the threat actors that we're trying to protect against. As long as there's money to be made in cybercrime, as long as there are nation states, intelligence programs that are trying to mine data about individuals or technology or intellectual property, those two pieces alone will suggest that we will be facing this for a long time to come. So the fact that we need to continually invest, which is another side of that investment coin that you're talking about, Eric. We need to keep investing in our technology, our people, uh, looking for those automation opportunities, finding ways to meet the business in terms of you know, our key enterprise objectives. Data, digitization, cloud, these things can't happen without cyber. 
um, it absolutely shapes a story that we have to talk to about the board, talk to with the board. And maybe the other piece I would add around the education is my program is not a static one. We are not being asked to protect the same assets in the same place as we were five years ago when I stepped into this role. As a company that, I think we've had a pretty progressive um, cloud journey, but we still have our own data centers. We have uh, critical data assets in not just one public cloud infrastructure, but several. We have the growth of devices from company issued devices to employee owned devices. I mean, it's just a massive prolifer proliferation of assets that we need to protect and the places in which they reside, which do create nuance in terms of our you know, security protection strategy. So that's part of the education story that we need to keep investing because the threats are rising, because the information and the assets that we need to protect keep growing. And we want to stay, you know, we, need, we absolutely need to stay at the pace of, of the adversaries that we face. I always say cyber education is, I always feel like cyber education is the number one reason that we have a six trillion loss scenario. And I'm gonna ask Dave this question too. When you think about, how many of you heard of spear phishing? You know what spear phishing is, right? Pretty much everybody. Um, you know, spear phishing continues to be one of the biggest vectors, if not the single biggest vector of attack that is out there because if I can get you to click on a link or download something, and now with all the socially engineered environments that we all have, I'm sure you have many of social platforms that you connect into and there's a lot of communications. If I can engineer something for you to click on, you basically have an infection. Then the infection can create lateral movement. The lateral movement can create some sort of foothold, which can then create some ex exfiltration of data. So cyber literacy and cyber education continues after 20 years, one man's view. And I chair safety security, by the way, on the board of directors of Delta Airlines, much like Katie Defense. We have to do a constant job trying to create literacy and raise literacy because at the end of the day, if we're not literate in the world of cyber, the breach rates go up. Dave, I want to ask you, you do a lot of board advice and a lot of you know, top-down. I mean, what do you tell boards now, today, and where do you think we're at in that journey yourself on literacy? Maybe from the top-down point of view, especially from EY, who is in almost every boardroom. For all of us on the stage here, you're in our boardrooms in many cases. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll start with the, with the education uh, part of the question because the, uh, the conversation at the board has changed, um, I would say, you know, quite a bit over the last you know, five, five to seven years. Um, when you know, Five to seven years ago, if I were to go to a board to talk about cyber, there was this sort of just curious fascination by all the board members. And they are really, I mean, it, it, this, this still happens where if cyber is the topic and it's scheduled to be a 30 minute briefing, it usually goes long. It usually goes 45 and sometimes an hour. In a board meeting is a really big deal because they've got a jam, jam agenda that is carefully scripted. All the material that goes to the board is submitted to the board weeks beforehand. There are all these you know, negotiations and planning before the board meeting so that the content that's presented to the board is kind of carefully you know, curated. So um, what, what used to be, I think, just kind of a, like, hey, this is you know, kind of a really interesting topic. Like, tell me more about it. But sometimes, Believe it or not, devolve or evolve uh, at the third level to, hey, what do I do to protect my home computer? And, uh, you know, can, what is your advice in terms of helping to protect my, my family members? Um, really just amazing. Um, you know, I think a lot changed. I mentioned that the not patch and attack, that's this, this you know, destructive malware that gets into, it was able to get into environments basically. Anything that the computer could connect to was, was called brick, was destroyed. That really, I think, was a, a big deal where the board started to think about cyber very differently. Because before that time, it was, oh, someone's going to steal uh, credit card information, or they're going to steal personally identifiable information, or they're going to steal protected health information. 
And I think the board was like, eh, you know, I mean, like, it's a risk, but is it really that big of a deal? Even IP theft, even the theft of intellectual property, which was a really, really big deal, has been going on for a while over a decade. There's an incredible article as a side comment in the uh, March 7th New York Times that talks about nation state uh, uh, cyber espionage uh, and other acts of espionage that I've encouraged everyone to read just to sort of get a sense of what was going on. But even, even uh, the, the theft of IP did not really frighten the board. Again, these destructive malware attacks hit and all of a sudden business operations cease. Companies cannot make cookies. Packages cannot get shipped. Uh, human beings in hospitals are not able to be cared for. And, and it became tangible, cyber became tangible. So I think that really was a big deal. And then what, what happened after 2017 was, you, you, know, uh, you know, you and the security function basically can get whatever you want. We will spend, there will be no question about spending. We will spend whatever it takes to protect the company. Um, now where we are today is what, what, what I'm hearing in a lot of these words is, I still don't know what the heck cyber really is. I have no idea what you guys are really doing. I have no idea if we're spending enough. I have no idea if we're going fast enough. Um, and I'm getting a little tired of this topic. We're not gonna stop supporting you, but I'm getting fatigued. I'm getting tired. You gotta make you gotta tell the story, you gotta make it, um, you gotta make it simple. So, you know, that combined with economic conditions right now that are that are a little bit shaky, um, I think is uh, gonna create some, some potential uh, disruption. Um, you know, in, in, in this space. So Dave, I don't know if I really answered your question because I kind of went, I went all over the place, but I did want, I wanted to give you some of that perspective at, at the board that the, the support is there, the interest is there. But there's also, I think there's a real opportunity to try to tell this, the value story in business terms to people on the, on the board who are not cybersecurity experts. So that's the other thing I want to mention. Delta Airlines is very, very lucky to have Dave on their board because Dave knows the space. Can I record this whole month? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but it's true because in, in most of the boards that I visit, there's typically one one person that really knows this topic and will have it is the, and they're the they're the person that's gonna be the, 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 the that's gonna challenge the, uh, the the security person. I think we're gonna see more sophistication mandated to be uh, sitting on the board by new rules that are going to come out from, uh, from the United States government that will make it a requirement to have someone who understands cyber on the board. So there are interesting career opportunities for people in the future to study this space and, and hopefully maybe make it up to sit on a public company board and function like Dave does for, for Delta Aerobats. But, but there's also, there, there's not a lot of sophistication, I would say, in general. Uh, there's a lot of ignorance, there's interest, but there's uh, also some fatigue. Can I double down on your comment, though, that tipping point for executives in the board is really sitting up and paying attention, though, when it comes down to that business disruption. That absolutely changed the narrative because it could be easy to say, oh, um, you know, loss of data, or this and that could be a risk in doing business. But I will tell you, I think the first time I forward slot to your point, um, I think quadrupled in that moment was right following uh, a major ransomware attack of a competitor that had, you know, weeks long, pushing on months long outage that really prompted the, we want to deeply understand, what, you know, all that you know about that, what the likelihood is of, of that being whether, whether you're having an outage of a couple of hours or days, there is a very real cost to that. That is much more attention grabbing. And I think that uh, you know, ransomware has certainly contributed to that. We're, we're really paying attention now. So thanks for. Well, and actually, I just want to add one other point to your point because for those of you that are interested in this topic, I mean, cyber is one thing. But what cyber has evolved into is really it's a story of being able to demonstrate resilience. And so that's what, what those ransomware attacks really proved was forget about defending yourself. What you've got to be able to do is you've got to be able to, you've got to get back up and running fast. And that is not an easy thing to do, believe it or not, to get back up and running. So a decade 
decade or so ago, disaster recovery and thinking about making tape backups and such was was, was something that people in tech, the technology space focused on. I, I will tell you right now, I think one of the most important things in cyber that we can focus on right now is this resilience and recovery. And the reason resilience and recovery is so hard is that most companies on earth do a terrible job of inventorying the things that they uh, run. They are, you know, we're, we're talking about people that are focused on business and running business and, and running technology and, and making things happen fast. It's not, believe it or not, it shock you that it's not well documented, it's not well understood. And I'll give you one quick vignette on the, on the criticality of this resilience point. I did work a few years ago for a very large company, and we um, did this analysis that was directed by the board after these, these ransomware attacks to go look at their, at their one of their business functions. Let's just say it was payroll. The company said, hey, we've got about 30 systems that are involved in payroll. Well, we did an analysis where we looked at the, what are called net flows. It's all the communication happening inside the enterprise. And we took the, the identifying the IP addresses of the 30 known systems. And we asked the question, what are those 30 things talking to? Are they only talking to themselves? We found 360 other systems that are involved in that function that the company didn't know, didn't know exist. I mean, this is an extremely well-run, sophisticated company. Literally didn't know that they existed. So then the other would say, well, if you didn't know those other 360 things are involved in, in this payroll function, you know, how on earth could you recover it if we get blown out by some one, by one of these ransomware attacks or, or a natural disaster or an outage and or, or who knows what? So th this is, I think, one of the really critical areas, the frontier areas on a cyber is just you can try to protect yourself all you, all you want to. When the bad thing happens, you've got to have a plan, a really, really good plan to get back on the money fast. It's amazing what a crisis does in a boardroom, and you know, at Delta we've had quite a few over over time as well, one of which was the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack, and for somebody who relied on massive jet fuel requirements to run the airline, there was an epiphany of a real kinetic problem related to cyber that suddenly was real to everyone in the boardrooms, and you know, one after another has led to that for sure. Before I get to you know some fun things, and in the time we have remaining, I want to talk about some of the hottest, coolest companies and categories. And ask Eric for a minute. I first want to make sure Katie and Dave, and maybe Eric, you two respond. The role of government here is intriguing to me in the world of cyber because just one minute of preamble for this. You know, here we are, we've been living in the world of breaches for 20 plus years. We talked about 2001, we can talk about stories, and yet we still don't have much in the way of accountability for cyber. And I, I talk in the past about Sarbanes-Oxley. How many know what that is? You guys know what Sarbanes-Oxley is, right? We all do. I always say I have like a tattoo on my arm that says socks after all the years of public company. But we, because we had a major crisis in accounting related to World, WorldCom, Enron, things that went on, we created legislation that drove us to create standards for gap reporting that ultimately raised the bar and we hardly ever hear about that kind of problem ever again. In the world of cyber, you know, we don't have any controls. We don't have accountability in the boardroom. We don't have things like material weaknesses and significant deficiencies to control and measure ourselves as risk factors for a company. This administration, in my opinion, has done a pretty amazing job pushing forward concepts of regulation, potentially all the way up to the boardroom, to such a way where performance and requirement for controls, as a practitioner and an advisor, and somebody who watches the industry, what do you think that should be? Because we have this huge threat environment, we don't want too much regulation because that can't be good. But what's your thoughts on that? I think the piece I'd like to comment on is a little bit distanced from the from the regulations themselves, and to say to see the Biden administration put out their cyber strategy two weeks ago, maybe and a half ago. The piece that really got me excited was what felt like a real intentionality and in their commitment around disrupting and dismantling 
threat actors. Because I can sit here and say, yeah, we call, we call law enforcement, we, we are a good corporate citizen and let the FBI know if we're seeing things, and that feels at times a little one-sided, right? I'm all about the public-private partnership in that, and, and, and we play a part in that, but when, you know, as a practitioner hearing like, okay, there's, there's real intentionality in stepping up, um, it gets a little bit to the more, what's in it for me, right? That feels like, all right, that's, that feels like true partnership. So, um, you know, the regulatory space, I think, is largely something I feel positive, positively that will help um, us all make a leap better, but that's the kind of activity and commitment I saw there, at least in words, that I think will be particularly meaningful. I love what you're saying, Katie. Can you imagine a scenario where in the, in the physical world there's a crime committed and the next day the same perpetrator commits the same crime? I mean, that's basically what we deal with every day in cyber. Somebody tries to attack and steal something from Katie and there's no there's no retribution for that. And the next day they're trying to attack you again and the next day and the next day and the next day. So our ability as a government to disrupt those actors in whatever means we can really is a step in the right direction, but it's an interesting line because now where is the line of warfare, crossing nationalism and things like that? Well, if I could just add that just for the, for the audience to make this, to make this even, even more real, I mean, I, I, I go and meet with, with, with companies like, like Dave's and, and others and look at, at emerging cybersecurity companies. I remember a couple of years ago, I went out to Silicon Valley, uh, really probably close to Silicon Valley Bank, but somewhere out of Silicon Valley, and uh, there's this 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 threat, um, cyber threat analytic company that's demonstrating their, their product, and what their what, what the company was founded from a, a couple of guys that came out of the NSA, and what they were able to do is to find what are called command and control nodes. This is basically a computer that is controlled by bad guys, and what they're doing is they're on it. And they're watching what the bad guys do, and so they, they're showing us this, this demo. It's a live demo. What they're showing us are a series of the largest law firms in the United States actively getting hacked by these, these bad guys. And I said to them, like, hey guys, is this a reporting? They're like, no, no, this, this, is, this is happening now. And I could see the names of, of, the, of the law firms, and I was stunned. And so the reality is the United States government it has the same you know, access to the same information. But at that time, the philosophy was: we got to watch this. You got to watch this. We want to study this. We want to see what they do. Or hey, we don't want to disrupt them. And I think a lot has shifted into this current administration, which I think is really healthy. Which is, I'm sure there's some of that that goes on when there's a lot of watching. But there's much, much more aggressive taking down of those kinds of nodes. And it's it's the government in, in concert with. Big tech, and so you know, you know, Microsoft, for example, has done a, like, a wonderful job of leaning in, in a coordinated way with the United States government, just taking down a lot of botnets that are used and controlled by bad actors. Which is one of the reasons, uh, perhaps, why we're actually seeing a decrease in the number of ransomware attacks of late. And I think this may have a lot to do with geopolitics and what's happening in Russia and Ukraine, and maybe that you know, some of those actors are a little bit distracted. Uh, but nonetheless, I, mean, I think some of these policy decisions that this administration has made, it doesn't matter where your politics are, the, the cyber policy maneuvers that are happening under this administration, I think, have been uh, very strong and, and excellent uh, and, and, and important. And I think one of the interesting ones that just came out is um, cyber uh, strategy that, that Katie just mentioned that, that came out you know, a week or so ago, is also even holding the cybersecurity vendors themselves accountable for, for cybersecurity. It's never been done before. That, to me, I think is enormous. To say, if you're gonna purchase a product, the liability responsibility sits on the manufacturer, not on the, not on the, on the purchaser of the product. So, I think a lot of really fun, fascinating, and important things are happening from a policy perspective. Thank you, thank you for sharing. I mean, hopefully you get a little side of the, I hate to call it the ominous side of all this, which is, there's still a lot to go. This threat environment is incredible. The regulatory environment hasn't risen to the point where we have the controls yet. We have a few years of pretty dangerous times in cyber. But I want to segue a little bit to some fun things too and bring Eric into this. There is, there is some incredible 
new companies and new categories happening in cyber. So, so many heroes and good things as well that are occurring. I mean, we're seeing our first companies just in the last couple of years reach seventy billion dollar market valuations. I mean, if you're on the side of an investor or a product vendor, you're seeing some incredible hyperscale inertias in certain categories. Eric, give us some fun ones. What are some cool, fun categories and maybe a few cool companies and all that, the others and stuff too? I'll make it with a cool term too. Uh, so, uh, for the geeks in the room, you know what layer one through seven means? It's sort of a network protocol. And, um, the term that we're using is invest in layer eight as people. And I'll be the first to help Angel or Seed Fund, a company that teaches security awareness and training to elementary students. Why is it that our kids are born with an iPad and an iPhone in their hands and they have no idea how dangerous that is and who they are connected to as a result of that? And the little thing that's in their room that's monitoring them and that can be, you know, so security awareness and training, should you should not wait until you are in a company who focuses on the problem in the boardroom to have a level of awareness for that. So the first thing that I think uh, where we see investing is, and you have companies in this space, Thrive and X. I didn't prompt them for that. <laughs> no, you didn't. Uh, but I love that company, by the way. Um, <clears throat> and so, you, know, you can either help teach ethical hackers, right? And so that's a whole new burgeoning category. You can be in Bali on your computer and make a living as an ethical hacker, right? That's pretty cool. Um, and so there's a whole kind of category of education to help them you know, do, be better at their job and, and have greater efficacy and find these bugs. Um, the other area that we uh, are seeing a large focus on, and, and if you're in the tech industry, you've seen this term shift left, right? What does it mean to shift left or, or shift right, right? It's nothing to do with the car. But as you get closer and closer to the source code, right? So let's just nip it in the bud, so to speak. And so can we ship code securely without impacting the business. And as every business digitizes and has some offering, digital offering to its consumers, is that a secure way to communicate with your customers, moving money, talking to each other, whatever, right? Insurance products. Uh, so this idea that we really need to think about security from the moment a developer is coding it is paramount. And there is some talk that this whole generative AI Everybody has opinions on that, but you know, um, may help us to focus and be more automated with source code out of the box. And I think that's a promising good use of that technology. By the way, there's a cool company, uh, not to promote them, but it's a cool company called Wiz. Anybody here of Wiz? The company just raised a few hundred million at a $10 billion valuation and is three years old. So $10 million valuation in three years, not a bad market to be in in cyber. There's also 3.4 million open jobs right now in cyber, to Eric's point of cyber education jobs. Here in America, there's nearly a million jobs alone open, and we can't find talent to fill the, the jobs. So that awareness and training and job skilling and it's so such a negative unemployment rate, right? So if your child is going to college, I mean, in the 90s, remember when there was this, um, there was this policy called ERISA, and there were these, um, you know, super fun sites, and we dumped chemicals for years, uh, that, you know, so environmental engineering, I mean, that was, the, if you wanted your job to have a guaranteed job out of high school, out of college in the 90s, it was to be an environmental engineer, and today, it's to be a cybersecurity practitioner, and I also think that a good use of community colleges and reusing a lot of that capacity, educational capacity, because cybersecurity is a trade craft. It's just something that you learn on the job with fundamental uh, education components or pillars of that education. And so I think that, you know, if you can start at the community college level, well, you can really make a difference. And another problem that's making this so much more difficult to solve, and, and, and you have to deal with this case, over 50% of your employee payroll, your headcount will turn over in the next three years because they can go switch to jobs, right? And in some cases, a lot of Katie's. <laughs> the retention. We'll go with your assumption. As an industry, that's what we're going with. And so we need to fix that. And I think education. Katie, what's the hottest 
category? What are you looking at as a practitioner? You know, is there a space you're like, wow, that I got a new cloud security or I gotta do something here? What what jumps out at you right now? I would say there's a little ebb and flow when we're when making my investment bets, whether it's EDR, um, IAM is, is sort of a steady state we investor. Need to Sorry, um, the whole endpoint time. detection and response, identity and access management. Sometimes it's in the email protection space. I love what you're saying about the people because as the tech gets better and better, we can leverage more innovation, whether it's AI, etc. You always have people in the middle, and you're always going to have people that make mistakes that can lead to cyber issues. You can have people that fall for the scams, the phishing, et cetera. So I want to double down on that. But, you know, maybe the message I want to send around what my favorite tech is, is, is like whatever is working. And for fear this is going to make me sound a little fickle, I will swap out, swap out technology that I've only had in place for a year. If it's no longer, um, doing what I expect it to do. It's no longer blocking attacks, it has misses. I mean, the first couple times we'll have a conversation with the vendor, take a look at the roadmap, provide that input. I don't have a really big window of tolerance for that. And so, you know, to say, yes, I need some of the biggest players that you mentioned up front, yes, I engage with startups. Sometimes I swap one for the other. It really comes down to like, what's working for me in the moment because, um, to your hockey goalie analogy that we started with, I need I need all of the tools that that is going to help me get to that objective. Practicality, simplicity. You know, you have a very complex environment. Trying to do that, I, I hear you. Yeah, you're in the park. Dave, you work with hundreds of vendors. Uh, I know with UI, you know, anything really exciting for you? We're here at South by. You know, what 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 super cool thing? Is there something cool AI that you're seeing? What else do you see? Well, I mean, the the AI piece is, is important just because if used properly, it can lead to enormous efficiency. So one of the areas that you know we're studying right now is, is just around something called vulnerability management. Vulnerability management is one of those fundamental things you have to do in cyber. Every single computing device has a whole series of technologies running on it, and there's always a hole. There's some sort of a hole that can be uh, can be exploited by a bad actor. They're really good at finding those ways and getting in. So I think of the holes is constantly changing as there's new patches and updates. And, you know, there's unforeseen issues in terms of interoperability when you're changing technology all the time. So companies really struggle with vulnerability management, just scanning, looking at the environment, kind of risk ranking those vulnerabilities, and then trying to close those holes as fast as possible. So AI and automation in combination around this vulnerability management topic I think it's very important to help try to very quickly uh, get the human out of the way uh, and, and try to close those holes as fast as possible. So I think that's an interesting space. I think the other thing is that I really like, I really like uh, the, the idea of simplification, standardization, and actually using fewer security products to get the job done and to help the business run faster, make the business run better. I love the idea of a CISO becoming more like a CT. The CISO saying, here's how we're going to get it done. And we can do it, we can do it very fast and effectively and efficiently. And we can add more value to the business. And that's, that, that's really critical. The sort of out there thing that we're studying that I think really is a big deal is quantum computing. And it's a, this is another kind of a fascinating geopolitical, really big geopolitical uh, risk issue. You know, the question is who's going to develop a you know, true, stable, scalable, affordable, quantum computing capability first. Will it be the Western world or will it be the Chinese? Um, <clears throat> and whoever gets there first has the potential to uh, leapfrog economically <coughs> whoever doesn't get there first. There are major and significant security implications. It's called post-quantum encryption because that computing power could be used to, uh, to, to decrypt things that are uh, using today's encryption technologies. Um, and so there's a big opportunity out there when quantum computing becomes available for, for firms like ours to replace all of those RSA, those I mean, two billion or so RSA tokens that are distributed around you know, every single kind of computing uh, 
uh, in, the, in the world and around every single business process around the world. It's a question of when, and it's very hard to pin down when. And my guess right now is probably seven years, five to seven years, seven may be more likely, but, but you know, who knows, who knows. Okay, well thank you everybody for listening to us and uh, wow, I mean, hopefully you got a little sense of the challenges, the opportunities that are happening here. I wish we had a lot of positive things to say about how we've solved this, like the cure for cancer, but you know, we wouldn't be practitioners of what we are and, and say that. I mean, we live in a really interesting times. It's almost like a, a bad way of saying the omen, but Boy, we're trying our best as a, as a community, and I invite all of you to just raise your education on this area, try to do our best, work together if we can, you know, from advisors to companies to practitioners, you know, we know we have to work together. The world has to work together to solve this problem. It's one of the most existential threats we face in our world today. And, you know, we hopefully as a team can work on solving that. So if you want to ask questions, we'll take them online. Uh, I know we're out of time for right now in whatever way we can. And uh, Eric, thank you. Katie, thank you. Dave, thank you. So fun hanging with you guys and being on stage. Yeah.